What's happening, y'all? This is Todd Wilson with another episode of Elevate Your Game, brought to you by our sponsor, Brand Scene. Shout out to my guy, Max Hazard. If you guys didn't know, sorry, I was hooping. He has the hats, he has the shirts, he has the shorts. Go out, make sure you guys support. Uh, today, we have a special guest uh, who's a husband, a father, uh, runs his own company. I'm not gonna say the name because I wanna say all his titles. Runs his own basketball development company, uh, and a co-founder of ABA Academy down in Orange County, Mr. Shea Frazee. Yep, good to see you, Todd. Yeah. Thanks for having me out here, brother. Uh, absolutely, man. It's been a long yeah. time coming. We, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been <laughs> missing a few times. A times. <laughs> busy yeah. time of year right now. Absolutely. The summer man. basketball in Southern California is the best, but yeah. it is busy. Absolutely, just working, working hard, working uh, yeah. hard, man. So All the time. We love to start this show off with your favorite hoop movie of all yeah. time and why. Yeah, I was a little bit nervous when you said we were starting with that because I'm not a big basketball movie guy. I mean, I've seen a few of them. He got game. Um, but my favorite, I think the one I watched the most, too, when I was younger was Rebound. You know that oh, one? Oh, yeah, with the Mark Earl, Lawrence. The, the, the Earl Manigault. Oh, Earl, oh, the original Rebound. Yeah, with okay, Don yes. Cheadle. Young yeah. Don Cheadle, Earl Manigault story. Um, my dad... My dad was pretty old for being my dad. Yeah, I mean, he's like 53 or something. So he knew all those old, you know, like the Connie Hawkins, Earl Manigault, like legends of street ball yeah. with like the lore, but there was no social media. There wasn't YouTube. There was nothing except for the, you know, the oral history of street basketball. Yep. So he told me about Earl Manigault, and then I saw that movie at Blockbuster um, and rented it and watched it quite a few times. Oh, um, I think I've only seen it once and I barely yeah, remember it. It's heavy. Young. Like, yeah. you know, he's shooting himself in the leg and you're yeah. like, dang, this is going down a, a, a bad, bad direction. But it was, it was a good story. You know, high drama. It was fun to watch. Man, that's a poster we have to get. I don't think we have that poster. We have the, the second rebound with Martin Lawrence and he's yeah. coaching kids. Different story. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, very different story. Very, that one's much lighter. <laughs> yeah. Not as serious. Absolutely. So when did you fall in love with basketball? Uh, I, as early as I can remember, the, this, as the story goes, by my mom. So I remember watching um, very, like, lightly, uh, I think it was the 92 finals with uh, the Bulls and the Blazers. And I guess just before that, and, you know, it gets all hazy when you get down to, like, three, four years old. When I was four, I think I started my Michael Jordan basketball card collection. Mm. Um, still and have yeah, that collection today? Still have that today. Me Some too. of them are pretty taken care of. I started going again during COVID when cards got hot again. Mm. Um, and then I have a, a little card strategy I've been using every year now, nice. uh, which is fun because it's always, you know, it's kind of like buying stock in a player. You get their rookie cards, you go for the PSA 10 cards and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I think that was it. And then I think Mike got me. Um, you know, he's just so inspirationally good. Yeah. And, and so... He was so famous at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that was about it, four or five years old. Yeah, Michael Jordan, man. Yeah, I, he's the I, guy. I didn't start playing until I was 11. And so oh, really? I, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I wish I would start. Like, where would my mind be? Okay. I, I mean, I watched that stuff, but I wasn't connected to it at all. And gotcha. so I actually started playing. I didn't even know what sports were. And you were out here? Like 11. I, I lived in, yeah, grew up in, like, East LA-ish area, Cerritos, okay. and moved out yeah. to the Orange County, then to Corona is where I really grew up. Okay. But that's where, and so when I moved to Corona when I was 11, and yeah. there was a hoop in the cul-de-sac in our street, and yeah. I just started playing 21 with the friends across the street, and um, it's my best friend, his older brother, showed me the AI cross and how to shoot over players okay, with a yeah. broom, and then there you I, go. Was, I was locked. You couldn't, that's been... It's been the love story ever since. <laughs> there we so, go. Yeah. The AI cross, that was a big one. Yeah, that, yeah. Took, that took, you know, that was like, I remember that specifically because that movement wasn't something that you'd seen before. Yeah. That combination of movement. I mean, it's so common now that everyone can kind of do it. But I remember just being like, how is he making that? Yeah. How is he making his body do that and the ball do that? It was very cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you fall in love at an early age. Um, yeah. What were your, your influences in basketball early on and kind of get you going? Uh, really, uh, I mean, I, I, Michael Jordan. Um, so I'm sitting there just like going through my basketball cards and looking at the stats. And I'm in Alaska, so we can only play for a couple months out of the year before it's snowy. So I had this hamper hoop that I modified by cutting the net and putting it up in my room. And so I'd be playing by myself and it would be like, you know, go downstairs, 
watch TV, watch basketball on TV, go upstairs, do all the same moves. I would say one of my, the best things that happened to me for my current job was I wasn't playing on a 10 foot hoop. I wasn't playing with a big ball. So there was nothing I couldn't do. I remember watching Antoine Walker and Ron Mercer in the 97 Kentucky Final Four and then going upstairs and shooting curls on my little hamper hoop because mm. Ron Mercer was like 100% on curls yeah. and shooting step backs. And you know, if you're at that point, I'm like 10, 11 years old, you can't shoot those shots on a 10 foot hoop that easily, especially right. back then when you weren't, people weren't training as much when they were younger. Um, so yeah, I think like, you know, that was a lot of it was doing that. And then I'd go to camps and stuff. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot of basketball leagues or like, wasn't a whole lot of basketball people in yeah. Fairbanks, Alaska at the time. <laughs> there was these brothers, the Hajdukovich brothers, who ran like the big summer camp, who were kind of the main basketball dudes, and they were great, and they ran a nice camp. But it wasn't, you know, out here, it's just, this is the place to be for grassroots basketball. Right. It's easy to fall in love, but it's also easy to find mentors, role models, people to like be like, I want to play like that. Yeah. Out so it's here. Like your imagination took you though and yeah. got you going on the hamper and yep. I think that's what's missing. And you made a, a point to the smaller, the lower hoop and the smaller yeah. balls. Like, is that a point of your emphasis for you when you're training younger kids? 100%. I do my son's little preschool class. It's three to five year olds, which has been fun. Also challenging because like, you know, I have to <laughs> learn how to communicate and deal with those little ones. And I just have the lowest of expectations, and we use the little ball, which is funny enough, it's harder to dribble because it's right. like, you know, hand-eye, it's like a smaller target for their hand. But we use the low hoop, um, and I think that's great for kids. I think just being able to see some success, being able to move around once in a while, having it being more challenging and, like, challenging how much power can I put behind the ball to get it up. But most kids are just so bad when they start when they're three, four, five, six that to, you know, you don't like, I don't know, most of us don't like doing things we stink at. So yeah. you want to give them, you know, some confidence and some like, I can do this. You put the hoop down, you make the ball small, and all of a sudden they're like, I can make some shots. Yeah, 100%. It's funny you say that. So my daughter is like, just hates getting stuff wrong. She's of just course. a perfectionist already, right? Yeah, and yeah. So what I found her doing is that she practices those things when I'm not looking. Yeah. Or she thinks I'm not looking. Right. Yeah. So I like kind of like, oh, okay, she's over there shooting on the hoop, holding her follow through. Like, I can't show her any attention. Because yeah. as soon as I say something, she curls up and starts, throws the ball, like, because she doesn't want to make a mistake. Uh, and I'm trying to teach her. I, I ask her actually every day, hey, what mistake did you make today? Yeah. It's okay. Like, we all make, they're not really mistakes. We're just trying to get better. There you go. And teaching kids that, I think even kids, I also train a kid who's 14, about yeah. to, about to, you know, playing some pretty high level basketball and he gets upset when he misses shots in a workout session. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I just got done working out NBA player and he missed more than you and he didn't say anything. Yeah. So you just need to get the shot up. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you teach? Are you, how are you doing that? Putting confidence in those younger kids? Um, so I'll start with the, the caveat or the disclaimer that I'm awful. I scream at myself like nobody, like I, there's no one that talks to me the way that I talk to myself when mm -hmm. I shoot. It's probably the one place, one of the few places where I just don't feel like I have very much self-control. I've gotten better over the years for sure. Um, but I struggle to not react to my misses even, and I feel like I'm a pretty good shooter at this point in my life. Um, one, I think the, just the basic idea of like, it's okay to feel the way you feel. You're su supposed to feel that way um, because, you know, you'd like to make it. And that's, that's good that you have that expectation of making it at the same time. Um, that feeling, the feeling of frustration, this actually helped me a lot. And I try to use it with other people. The feeling of the frustration that feels almost overwhelming is the feeling of your mind and your body figuring out how to complete the task. Yeah. And so anger is a, uh, anger is kind of something that takes the edge off of other feelings. So when you have that disappointment and that frustration, you use anger to kind of uh, not have to feel that. So I'll just feel the anger instead. And so if you can, you know, give yourself a little bit of space and allow yourself to feel that frustration and that disappointment, you're allowing your body to solve the problem over long periods of time. Um, 
and then if you do have that, you know, you're going to have an outburst here and there. Some kids more than others. Some kids not at all. And I'm like, you should probably get angry. He's like, <laughs> right, if right. you hit that I front, need some kind of reaction. If you hit that front rim one more time, we're all going to be sad, dude. Like, do not hit that front rim one more time. But, um, yeah, to give yourself the grace of like, okay, can not, I know I'm going to get angry. I'm not going to have an outburst. Uh, I guess I, I stole this term from someone. I forget who I would call it like vaccinating against failure. So like I have a visualization in my head of like what it's going to be like when I miss four of the same shot in a row. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm sick. And uh, mm -hmm. because I've already kind of visualized what that's going to be like, that's within expectation now. That's not out of the question. And so, I, you know, if that happens, you know, stuff that comes in within our expectations is a lot less jarring to our emotional equilibrium. Do you have a degree in psychology? Not at all. Oh, man. This is good stuff. Oh, I, I appreciate it. You study you no, study something I just, here. You know, I just study <laughs> myself getting pissed off all the time. <laughs> um, Self-evaluation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trying for it. And then, uh, you know, and then you, you know, you kind of have a better feel for it. And... You know, you you let that one go. But my big thing is like, OK, you show some emotion, but can whatever drill we're in, whatever we're doing. If you show the emotion, can you do it without missing a beat and then letting it affect your next that's, thing? That's it. Because, you know, it, it'd be great if you never winced and never showed anything. But I don't even know anybody, you know, that's that's never shown anything. Yeah. So, but can you be on the next play by the time it happens? And sometimes it's like that and you don't have time to show anything. Sometimes you can show something, but you know, the next play or the next ball is coming and you've got yourself, you know, ready again yeah. without that. I could, you'd call it like the refractory period of like an anger outburst is like <laughs> tightness. And then, mm -hmm. so you have to get the yeah. before you have to perform the next skill. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I talk with players about it a lot and you know, you have different players on different ends of the spectrum. You have people, like I said, that they don't react to anything. And I'm like, are you frustrated? And they'll be like, and I'm like, well, we, we need to find a way to get you like, to care. Do you love basketball? Yeah. 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 <laughs> do you, like, do you, do you know you're missing them, right? You know, you're beating the front of the rim up. And then there's some people that are just like, you can see that they've taken themselves out of it after three misses. And it's like, okay, we got to, we got to find the balance here. Yeah. Man, that's, that's, I think that's good philosophy for life. You know, like yeah. hidden, you know, something happening to us and having that refractory period as you're talking yeah. about. I think that's it, it connected with me, just having that anger and then, all right, how can I get to the next thing yeah. fast enough and be emotional enough to be human, right? And yeah. not be a robot, 100%. but also not overreacting and being the example more than anything as a parent right now is like, man, my daughter's watching me do everything. So when yeah. I react, and my son, when I react, they're going to, she's learning that stuff. Yeah, 100%. And as a coach and a trainer, it's the same thing. And so yeah. just relating that to life in general, man, it's, I, I love basketball. It's, you know, way yeah. of teaching us about ourselves. Very um, much so. It's a great learning tool, great tool for managing our emotions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, coming from Alaska, not a lot of basketball stuff out there. We have not some greats, uh, Shane Battier's some and solid uh, ones. Mario Chalmers, right? Those no, guys. not Battier, not Battier, Boozer. Boozer, Boozer my bad. Carlos Boozer, okay. Boozer, Chalmers, uh, Langdon, who Langdon just got that Langdon. Pistons job, and fired Monty Williams today. Quick, yeah, yeah Monty Williams <laughs> is going to get his money, though. Yes, um, he is. And uh, yeah, Chalmers was my year. He fried me in high school yeah. multiple occasions. He was really good <laughs> in high school. He's like the number one point guard. Um, I don't know. I haven't kept up with the Alaska basketball. I never mm -hmm. went back after I left. My whole family moved. But uh, we had some pretty solid players at the top end. It's just you don't have the the, the volume of players, so you don't have as many good ones. You yeah. know, per capita, maybe it's okay. So uh, what age did you leave Alaska, and where did you move to? I left at 17 uh, my, for my senior year of high school. My whole family moved to Seattle, help out with my grandparents uh, to the Seattle area great basketball area mm -hmm. um went to redmond high school uh bellevue college a little two-year school over there um and then i moved down to cal state east bay nice. um and then after i finished at east bay i was going to try and play pro for a couple of years didn't work out ended up moving down here and as soon as i moved here a buddy of mine invited me to come here and check it out charlie torres you may have met charlie mm. through the years uh he does the same stuff oh, okay. that we do uh I was just like, this is the place to be. I came down for Southern California summer, summer basketball, and I was like, this is it right here. Yeah. 
like, and it was the lockout. So there was oh, all sorts of good players playing all over the place, two, three good runs per day. And I was like, geez, this is great. So I just stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, working from, so you were there your whole childhood. Yeah. And you were good enough to still get uh, college opportunities. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. What do you credit that to? Like what, what, not having those resources, like, like you said, you've been, we'll take Jared. You've been working yeah. with Jared since yeah, yeah, middle yeah. school, right? He's had somebody who's For helped sure. him through this process since 12, 13, yeah. something like that. You didn't have that necessarily, right? Not as much. Not no, as much. I had people along the way, but nobody, yeah, the, he, he elite resources, very yeah. elite resources, not just me, but yeah. all the way along from Sacramento, all the way through elite resources, the yes. top of the top. So what do you credit being, having that opportunity to even play college? Um, one, I mean, genetics, I'm decently sized human being, like I'm not five, six, like, so, <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty big person, pretty physically like strong person, like decent bone structure, decent like physicality. Um, I started, I was really into Michael Jordan, obviously, and he kind of, I, he probably wasn't the first person doing it, but he was definitely the most noticeable guy who was like, people were talking about his work ethic and lifting weights and getting bigger and stronger. And so I was on the, the any jump program, jump, air, jump air attack, alert, yeah, air jump alert. attack, yeah. uh, <laughs> with Tim Grover, the strength shoes, scam, scam central strength shoes. Is that why your knees are jacked uh, up too? Probably, yeah, probably, probably walking on my toes for know. years at yes. a time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was into that when I was 14, 15. And so that, that helped a lot. Um, I mean, I played a ton. Like, you know, we didn't have AAU out there like that. Um, but you know, I was organizing pickup games. Um, you know, my the getting shots up with my friends, like organizing early morning shooting sessions, playing as much as I could possibly play. Um, you know, and so yeah, I, and pretty pretty decent. And then I played not a ton of sports, but uh, I played a lot of hockey. I was a better hockey player. I'm okay. kind of built like a hockey player. Yeah. Um, so I played a pretty competitive level of hockey. I think that really helped me understand quick decision making and like, you know, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, basketball, they have their differences, but there are all those like triangle games where it's like mm -hmm. one possession and then two or three receivers and then cutting around and then, you know, making decisions on how you get rid of the ball or how you attack into gaps based on the positioning of the other people. The thing with hockey is like one, you're moving super fast. Um, two, you have to be really physical uh, a lot of the time. And then three, uh, like, what do you call it? Like the, you have to get rid of the puck. Like you, it's not like basketball where I can just hold it and just, I'm gonna go. Like you, you well, you, I mean, you can, but they're gonna take you out. Right. Like you're, it's not gonna go well for you. <laughs> so it's a lot of passing and moving and giving and going and, and like weaving and stuff like that. And I think that helped me for the style that I needed to play to be effective at that time in basketball, you know, the early 2000s, that probably helped me a lot. Yeah, no, that's a yeah. very unique approach, like having that experience. I've never met anybody who had experience with hockey, right? Like as yeah. a, another, as their other primary sport. You know who was basketball. really good at hockey was the Ware Brothers. Oh. I yeah, I heard, I've heard that they were like national level street hockey players. Wow, that makes when sense. When they were Freaking middle school. Big old dudes, man. Big dudes, yeah, yeah big strong dudes. Yeah, good so. players. Yeah, no, that's pretty, that's awesome. And then, so moving to Seattle, having yeah. that college opportunity, what was your calling card in basketball? It started shooting, yeah. shooting. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess like I was a pretty smart player, like, like passing, but I wasn't like drive and dump off guy. I was like, if we ran flex, like I could throw it off your ear yeah. on the, the, the cuts and stuff like that. Like throwing back cut passes, like I was decent with the ball, but I wasn't like, the elite wizard drive through the middle and throw it behind my head past guy. I was right. like, I know the spacing, the hockey stuff. I yep. know the spacing, I know the timing. I know where people are supposed to be. I hit people on time, on target, stuff like that. Um, and then shooting, a lot of shooting, a lot of footwork, um, anything within two dribbles, Who a lot of threes. <sighs> uh, basketball camps and then me. Yeah. So like, you know, I had these basketball cards, a lot of basketball cards. And I was really into all the players and, you know, everyone has their own unique little shot. And so, you know, when I'm in the room, in my little room and it's cold and there's nothing to do. And this is before you had a lot of the entertainment, you know, modalities that we have now. You know, you're going to shoot 10 free throws like Horace Grant and then I'm going to shoot 10 free throws like Penny Hardaway and then I'm going to shoot 10. So 
looking back on it, maybe this is me explaining it later, like variability really helps your understanding of how your body works and how to do a skill. So like I had, I think I had a lot of variability in the way that I shot the ball. Did you and shoot so like Shaq too? I would try. Like, you know, you'd see and you'd keep, I'd track it and be like, how many out of 10? I'd probably miss a bunch kind of like subconsciously on purpose. Yeah. So I'm like, Shaq sucks. <laughs> but yeah, a little bit of that. Uh, probably basketball camps and myself. Oh, awesome. I remember I made a, my first big, big jump was when I started shooting a lot of one-handed shots after this NBC camp in mm -hmm. Auburn, Washington. Um, and I started this shooting routine that I use a form of to this day, this one-hand shooting challenge thing um, that really worked for me and did well for me. And that was probably one of the, the biggest influences on my shooting and the form shooting sequences that I still use. No, that's awesome. It's crazy how those things like yeah. having a routine and then, like you said, figuring your body out. I think it's super. Yeah, important. I was working with a kid this morning. Okay. And kind of shoot. He 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 positions the ball in the middle of his body. Okay. And you know we're trying to get. I'm trying to get, just get him squared up. He has a great shot. Great yeah. touch on it. And maybe two months ago, like I really saw him getting here and kind of coming across. Okay. He's a shot maker. Like okay. It's just a bucket, and I'm like man, do I really have to change that? Yeah. Like, man, how his body is and the way he shoots it, said, let me just make sure he doesn't come across his face. His gather point, yeah. he's in the middle of his body because he's like 6'5", six, 6'4". Six, okay. Like, he's going to get that off. Why am I yeah. changing that? When before, it was, I remember when I first started training pros, it was like, no, we have to fix their shot. They can't shoot like that. Oh, you yeah. Know, that kind of stuff, with, who I was working with, they wouldn't, like, that was the the law. It's like, you have to fix their shot. Or yeah. They're not even going to get drafted. But, you see so many different variations in body types and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, and you have all this, these shots that they've shot for all these years grooved into their kind of memory of how to shoot. I think that used to be, you know, kind of a, a big thing was like, we can fix your shot. Yeah. And now I don't think, I don't know, I don't, I get scared of the word fix. Like if we try and fix things, I'm terrified of trying to fix people's shot. I'm going to try everything else before I do that, because if I try everything else, one, we're going to build like this relationship equity where like you can yeah. tell that I'm really trying to help you without ruining things. Yeah. It's not my way or the highway. It's like we're working on this together. And then two, if there comes a point and there are points with some players where it's like, hey, we've got to we've got to do something here. This is not going well. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I've built that trust to like, OK, like I, I'm going to listen to you because you sat here and rebounded these balls off the front of the rim for me and tried X, Y and Z you know, constraints before we like, we're like, hey, we've got to move this here and it has to be a conscious effort. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. You've, you know, it, you talk about it, years ago when it used to be, let's fix the shot. And now it's yeah. like, OK, what what can we do to improve without taking too much away from what they already yeah. have? I look at Ty Tyrese Halliburton, right? Like, yeah, his shot was funky coming into the league. Yeah. And uh, I actually know the person who first tried to fix his shot and didn't get oh, fixed. Oh, no. Yeah, and it was the person it was, who told was it ever broken though to have to fix? There you go. And so he, I think he starts working with Drew Hanlon. Two okay, years, two years ago maybe, and Drew just improved what he had. Like you're talking yeah. about, like his shot physically looks the same, he just has more arc and he has follow through and it's, yeah, you know the those types of things. It's like, yep. like okay, maybe that's the actual recipe to fixing shots because I, yeah, I, coaches, especially ones who grew up where they were, you know, basketball shooting camps. Yeah. Like drilled out. You got to shoot this way. Got to fix this. Got to fix that. And it's like, not all the time. <laughs> not no, not time. at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and then to, to add to what you're saying, like, and I've learned this in the last few years, even more, the shooting fixes, like, I don't even like the word fix, but sh you'll change your shot without subconsciously just by shooting a lot because there'll be small things that you pick up on that you're not even aware that you're picking up on that are working. Mm -hmm. um, that's why a lot of times, you know, if, if you have a good player, you know, who already has kind of their stuff dialed in and then you don't see them for, you know, three, four, five, six months and they come back and they're shooting it slightly differently than you remember and you'll ask them like, hey, you do anything with your shot? And no. But the ball is going in a little bit more and they kind of made one of the adjustments that you'd been thinking about, but you didn't want to like mess with their shot at all because they were already a good shooter and things were going well. Um, so I think that part of the, the shooting 
growth curve is underrated. The, yeah. the subconscious and unconscious adjustments that we make, yeah. um, you know, over time. Yeah. It's a and lot I, of I shots to be good. The, the big part that you talked about, too, at least with your shot, is that you were watching other people shoot. That yeah. That could make the ball, too. I, I don't know if kids do that now. Like, no. I always, like, I literally send every kid I work out with a video of Clay when he's in the Olympics a few years ago. Okay. And he has, like, nice. 36, like, hey, watch him shoot. It is yeah. the same shot every single time. I'm not telling yeah. you shoot like Clay, but I'm telling you shoot like Clay. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, there you go. do that. And, like, even my shot has molded to look like Clay Thompson because I've watched that video so much. Like, yeah. I want to look like Clay when I shoot. That's just yeah. how I want to look. I mean, nice looking I don't make it, a, it. It looks... Kids tell me all the time, like, Coach, you have the nice looking shot, but it never goes in. I'm oh, like, no. I don't get my reps up. That's all. There I you see, go. So you're on the shooting machine still. I got to get no, back I'm, to that. I'm, yeah, I shoot. I try to shoot almost every day. Yeah. I yeah. got to get back to that. got to get back to that. It's fun. Your transition, so you went to a small college. What uh, level yeah. was that college? Just I, community college. It's okay. in the NWAC, Washington, Oregon school. Mm -hmm. um, ran around the perimeter, shot a lot of threes. It worked. Um, yeah, played a little bit of two, a little bit of three, a little bit of four because it's like small school and yeah. I could like bang with the guys down there a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Had a really good coach out there, really enjoyed my time, awesome. um, learned a lot. What was your recruitment like coming from a junior college and then moving to the next level? <sighs> none. Um, <laughs> no recruitment, <laughs> none. Um, no, I had, so coming out of high school, I had like D3s around the area, like uh, Puget Sound um, was probably the main one. Um, there's a, what do you call it? There's a NAI conference down the coast in Northern Oregon and Washington, um, Evergreen State College, Northwest College, yeah. um, a couple of those schools. Uh, but... I wanted to move to Southern, uh, to, to California. Um, the girl I was dating at the time was going to Stanford, and she was she was she was elite athlete. She was going to go to Harvard or Stanford and run track. And she was like, "If I go to Stanford, can you meet me somewhere in the Bay Area?" And I was like, "Well, I'll just hit some coaches and show up and try out." So I hit Cal State East Bay. Uh, I told the guy I was going to come out there and like play open gym. I don't know, April or so, the year before. Went out, played open gym, played really well, was in really good shape at the time. Um, and he was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it was Division three, so he was like, you can walk on. That's all there is at that <laughs> level. Yeah. Um, I wasn't one of like his guys, but he was like, you're good, definitely good enough to be on the team. So if you get into school and you're here, you know, you can, you can be on the team. Nice. Uh, so then I was on the team. Our motivation, man. Up. The motivations that get us to yeah. places. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, got me down here. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Right? Um, so, how do you, so after the Bay, after you graduated, you moved straight to Cal Southern California? Yeah, right so after? right when I got to the Bay Area, three weeks, open gyms are going great. I'm thinking to myself, I'm about to start. I'm killing these dudes right <laughs> now. But that's every college player the first couple of weeks. You're like, I'm killing. Yeah. Um, Thinking back, I'm like, what are you doing? You're just lower your expectations. Uh, but like three weeks in, I go to the coach's office and he wants me to meet somebody. And there's this kid sitting um, in the chair across from the coach. And he had this long brown hair. He looked like Jesus. And he was like, hi, this is Charlie. He was like, this is Charlie. He's going to be our point guard. And that's the Charlie Torres guy I was talking mm -hmm. about. So I met Charlie there. Charlie did two months at school and never got to play a game because he got a pro deal in Mexico because Charlie's inspirationally good at basketball at that time. Charlie wow. was playing in the Drew League at that time, averaging 20 points a game in the Drew League at 5'7", 135 pounds. Oh. Unbelievable nice. skills. Like, Dang. like nutmeg you and catch it on the other side, shoot a layup off the pick and roll, nutmeg passes, off the elbow passes in the half court. Like, Face up footwork threes, like I'm sure off he's the dribble on YouTube. threes. I can see this kid on you YouTube, could probably man. find Charlie on YouTube in some old school. He used to play on, remember Keith Kloss? Yeah. He used yeah. to be on Keith Kloss Drew League team. Okay. Charlie was inspirationally good at basketball. Like, he was the first person, like, they tried to pick him up and practice full court. He would just, like, immediately beat the guy, get him on his back. And, you know, it was like, this is like 2007, 2008. There wasn't that many guys doing the dribble hold you know, jail dribble, whatever people call it now, all the way up the court, just could not get back in front of him. Like, 
unbelievable ball handler, shooter, just basketball player in general. Um, so we would work out all the time. And so he really got me into how to create space and handle the ball. Like you're, a, being, like a, you're being trained to be a trainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He really got me into the footwork, ball handling. He was also a very good shooter, so like a lot of off the dribble shooting stuff. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my pathway down here because he left to play pro in Mexico, mm. played for a little while, came back, was coaching at La Mirada High School with Derek Williams. Remember Derek, yep. Arizona Derek, Arizona. Mm -hmm. number two pick in the draft. That was the year that Derek went to the NBA, was the lockout year. So he invited me down to run workouts with Derek and check out the scene. And yeah, that was when I, that was how I got down here. Wow. Yeah, Man. it was good times. What a dream. Yeah, what a dream. yeah, basketball <laughs> dream, it's, it's great. So yeah, so picking up, so that you were done with your basketball career at that point? Uh, I was still trying to play, um, but you, you, like, I just wasn't consistent enough performer I got, honestly, I got too into, this is the classic white guy problem. People tell you you're not good enough at ball handling, and instead of being like, for sure, but that's not really what I do, I shoot the ball. And I'll get better at ball handling in the next three, four, five years or whatever, or slowly as I go, because that's my, I don't know, B skill, mm -hmm. C skill. But really, I shoot the ball. I got too into like, I'm going to be good with this ball, and I'm going to figure mm -hmm. out... And I didn't have my identity locked in like I needed it locked in in my moment to like, you know, you go to all these different tryouts, you get some different opportunities. They're not great opportunities, but there's something to get you that starter pack, that $600 a month in Estonia deal, yeah. which is, you know, not the best by any means, but it's the deal that gets you going. Yeah, if you're 22, 23. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have it at the time. I didn't have it, go like self-awareness. Go back and talk to Shay of that 22 23 yeah. year old Shay what would you tell that person now as knowing all you know yeah I think because I think it's on both sides right that's you said that's the white guy problem yeah said, hey you don't have handles and the black guy problem is hey you can't shoot and <laughs> so it, it's it, it's, hey, it's it's real 100 percent. it's stereotypical and, and there's everything in between not, yes and there's there's everything in between outliers 100 percent. yeah but that is the stereotypical thing what would you tell that young Shay now um, I wouldn't tell him anything because he wouldn't listen. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I would say, you know, like you, you're, uh, your best skill is your shooting and you have to have the self-awareness to understand that what people are going to value you for and what people are going to want you for is your ability to shoot and then your ability to create off of your shooting. And so, you know, handling the ball, being better with the ball, understanding how to do the pick and roll stuff, understanding how to create off the dribble, you know, don't stop working on that. But when you play, understand who you are and how you get your money. And that needs to be like 10 of 10 every time you're going to die on that sword. Yeah. And yeah, I think, you know, not to bring Jared in here too often, mm -hmm. that's been one of the things he's been best at and that I'm always most impressed at is like, Same you know, point. he gets a lot of that criticism, not athletic enough, not fast enough, not good enough with the ball. And then he goes out there and he's like, well, you're going to help and I'm going to shoot it, and it's going to go in. Yeah. And then you're going to close out, and then I'm going to sh go by you and shoot it, and it's going to go in. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I needed to play back then. That 22, 23-year-old me, that was what I needed to do. That's I didn't awesome. need to prove that other stuff to anybody. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. No, I, I think a lot of kids need to hear that. That's a great speaking point, and even for parents, right? Because oh, everybody 100%. wants their kids to be a point guard or to do this and to do that and to score. When if you look at even a college team, there's only two guys who are really scoring over 13 points a game. Maybe. Yeah. Like, not even talking about 20-point scores. It's not a lot. Barely any 20-point scores. Your Almost Your role not. and what you provide is what's most important. And that, yeah. that discussion with parents. And not, not to stop developing your other skills. I've seen <laughs> when Kawhi came into the league, he is not who he is today. No. At all. He couldn't shoot. He was just a defender, you know, slasher, athletic yep. dude. Now he's become, you know, a shooter. He has post finishes and he's yeah. developed into that because he stuck to what he needed to to get to that point and then be developed after. And so yeah. um, knowing your role is extremely, extremely, extremely important. So it's the biggest self awareness. Yeah. Self awareness is like the, one of the major seeds of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing what you do out there.
Awesome. All right, so you're going to these runs now. You're, yeah. Are you helping coach? Like, how did you step into the training side of the business? What I'm so saying? usually, because I was trying to play a little bit at the same time, it would be like I I would get there early, get my warm up in, do a little bit of my own stuff, then jump in with Charlie, help out with you know he was running the workouts and I was assisting, like you know playing a little defense, rebounding the you know the stuff that you do when you're assisting someone running the workouts. And then we were always big on a lot of playing, one-on-one, three-on-three, five-on-five. So we'd run the workout for a while, and then we'd play, and then I would always jump in and play. Um, and that was my role for the first, I don't know, three, four, five, six months Got it. or so. Got it. A lot of that, a lot of playing. Nice. That was my favorite. Yeah. Still right. is. Still is, right? Yeah. yeah, I still play these kids. Like, <laughs> let's, let's check out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, okay, so when did this become a business for you? Or when did this become your uh, means of making income? Um, so not too long after that. So, you know, we had the, the, the lockout happened, extended summer. We're just driving around, running workouts for, you know, pretty good players at the time. But then also running some workouts for just your regular high school kids. Uh, not too many youth kids at the time. And then um, we we're also helping coach at La Mirada because Charlie was an alumni and they didn't even have a head coach at the time and we were bad. Hmm. And so uh, Open Gym Premier just took the space at American Sports Center that was, I think, designed for the move of the Sacramento Kings to Anaheim when they were talking about uh, doing that back in the day. Well, so that that, so that didn't know. happen. Yeah. OGP took the space. They had just downsized their business because they had like these, like, they had like a whole big blow up, like we're, you know, we're on the scene, a bunch of teams, and then kind of people left and took their teams with them. They consolidated, but they took that space as their home and they needed coaching. And, you know, after everyone started leaving, I'm like, this is really starting to slow down. What am I going to do? So I took a job at OGP coaching, um, you know, one of their 12U teams. And that gave me a spot to work out every day, a gun to shoot on, a place to hit the guys that were still around that were trying to get workouts in during the day and play pickup. Then I'd go to La Mirada, run practice, run workouts at La Mirada at night, play some more. And that was kind of my routine. my routine for a couple of years until I kind of got the business going and got a feel for like the youth side of things. And, you know, the high school was being taken care of by La Mirada. And then in the summer, you know, some of the pro guys and the college guys would come back and, you know, been running some semblance of that ever since. Wow. Man, it's crazy. You just rolled into it. Yeah. Stayed in the gym, kept working. Yeah, and exactly. Things happen. I, I I love the how genuine and how smooth it was. Like that transition, right? Yeah, I feel um, like I've been doing the exact same thing um, for a long, long time. It's just sometimes I get paid for it now. <laughs> right, and right. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm sure this whole you being a trainer, high school coaching, all this, it rolled into you having ABA Academy. Yes, yes. So, um, what, 2015, 2016, I met these ladies. I was doing some stuff at a Boys and Girls Club in Newport, and I met these ladies who one of them was working at the Boys and Girls Club, and the other one was a friend of hers. They were trying to help uh, uh, me with my training business because I just don't do well on the business operations, organization end of thing. I'm kind of more of a practitioner. I'm out there doing it. Yep. <laughs> um, and so, at, you know, we talked about different forms that that could take. And even back then, we were talking about doing a prep school. Um, but we were like, man, that seems like a big thing to bite off, especially at that time. It was even a bigger thing because there wasn't that many of them. It was kind of before this boom of, uh, you know, without making it a pejorative fly by night pop up prep schools. Um, and so we actually just just completely stole your idea and did it in Orange <laughs> County. <laughs> we were like, you know, uh, if we're not going to do a prep school for high school kids because you need a bunch of money and you need the right education system because it has to be NCAA compliant and you need the good enough yeah. kids that it's not like, you know, what are we really doing out here? Um, why don't we just do a middle school? Um, and at the time, uh, I'm training Devin Askew quite a bit, and Jordy, his little brother, uh, you know, he was looking, he was looking for a place to go to school. They just moved down. And so we were like, well, why don't we, Dev was repeating eighth grade, Jordy was in like third grade, and we were like, why don't we use them as the test case, mm. kind of 
help them through this year, talk to them about what they're going through with their whatever online curriculum they're using for one person being a hold back and one person being in grade. Um, do the training, you know, and then we'll use our lat as the learning experience and then next year launch. Right. And that was kind of how the generate the origin story of ABA. Wow. Yeah, it was yeah. cool. Sorry, yeah. dude, we stole Definitely. your thing. You'd have corp it's prep not OC. No, I'm just <laughs> no, no. So it's not it's never stealing when you're helping kids, but yeah. I tell people all the time, it was cool. I thought you know, I didn't hear about it actually until years later. Okay. I had no idea. And then I had I think when um uh, it was right before Jaden Harper went there, actually. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because Jaden Harper was in core. Okay. But his mom worked in Orange County. And yeah. So the next year he ended up going to ABA. Um, Got you. Just a better fit for them. And yeah. And that's when I heard about it, like, when I was like, oh, they have these other... I didn't know that they existed anywhere else. Dude, I thought I was you guys were the only one rolling. There yeah. was a couple people that were doing, like, little shops, but yeah. they weren't, like... It wasn't a brand It wasn't, like, years where school. it was going. Yeah. Like, you guys had it going. Like, you know, 25, 30 kids, good players, like, yeah. organized, like, going to be a year-in, year-out thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, Crazy. That that part is crazy, Duke. I started very similar. It was like, hey, okay. Johnny Ju Zhang wants to homeschool and do training. Can you do that for him? I was training him at the time. Okay. His dad said that. I'm like, sure. I do, yep. I'm not doing anything during the day. And it literally was that homeschool style that first year. Yeah. And it was eight kids literally in a room like this. Yeah. Doing their homework and everything. And then that next year, I was like, okay, I'm not doing this homeschool thing. I was literally. Yeah. Like, operate every did every yeah you were doing you know? the most i wasn't doing the school part <laughs> i had the smart, ladies doing the school man. part because we're still like you know 25 kids in a, you know rooms like this mm -hmm. doing the homeschool thing but i couldn't do both that'd yeah. be impossible you have teachers and like real teachers in there yeah and, yeah and exactly assisting with everything and i was like yeah i don't want any parts of this academic stuff yeah and that that was it that, that one first year was our only year where it was like that and then we did the traditional setting and partnered with the school and whatever but um i thought it was cool i was like okay so this is i, I felt like i was a little ahead of the curve yeah you were you were for winter sure winter circle did it apparently the same we started the same year but they did it with football yeah and so that that was there as well but i didn't learn about them until literally five years after i saw them on the news and I'm okay like, hey i'm doing the same thing do you see him on the news and that one guy scammed everybody with the education services is yeah. that what you saw yeah that's what i saw yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah he got a lot of money for that <laughs> yeah crazy yeah crazy you guys watch out for these schools. he was he was <laughs> pitching us he was pitching us and really? yeah one of the ladies i was probably for it because i'm not paying attention enough sometimes and one of the ladies was like no nah, i got a bad feeling about him and uh, we went a different direction, and then, yeah, he, he took a lot of money. Yeah, crazy. Parents, watch out for these prep schools. Right. Um, make sure there's real business people involved, not yeah. just sports people. That's my biggest advice, I think, is that make sure that, that those academics and yeah. you go look on the website yourself. Don't just trust anybody's word yeah. about what's being given for academics. Um, I'm not against anybody helping kids get their education, being prepared for high school with any sport. I love it. Yeah, uh, I hope this industry continues to grow and become more, um, just more and more professional at, at yeah. that level. Because I think this is the the direction that basketball basketball is moving in is getting kids in a school environment with basketball like they do in Europe, where it's part of their day, part of their curriculum, so yeah. they're learning the right way. And so we're. I hope so. I hope so. I <laughs> hope it can be more normalized and more not regulated. What's the right word? Just, yeah, more organized. Yes. That, and, that and it's, it's the wild, wild west because anybody can pop up and rent a room yeah. and give homeschool academics and train people. When yeah. There needs to be, there's, there's more to that. You need to have, really have people involved who are monitoring all of that. For sure. Accountability. And, and honestly, it's not for everybody. It's like, we're not people. hitting a thousand percent on, like, everybody should come to this program because you're going to be successful in school on the back end. Some kids need to be yes. in a real classroom because once they hit high school, they're not there in so the way that they need to be when they hit happened. high school. That's what happened with us is that the social aspect of those first eight kids when yeah. they hit high school, they started telling us, like, it was so weird going to class. Yeah, it was exactly. so weird. Like they didn't know how to operate around females almost like because oh, they, no. they were, you know, just eight dudes in a room doing okay. schoolwork, being boys and hooping. And okay. so that transition, I was like, OK, we have to add that social aspect. We have yeah. to add that academic, that that environment needs to be the same. And so um, that's that's why CORE went to that whole other route. And that's why we haven't even done. We won't do homeschool ever again. Yeah. Um, 
just because of that, it's like, man, it needs to be a real environment because not everyone can fit that model. No, that's not sure. at all. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. So um, transitioning into that training, things start growing for you, right? Um, yeah. You start getting players. You trained over how many NBA players now at this point? I don't know. Like, if you count, like, you know, some one-offs and stuff, probably, like, 40 or so. Nice. So you have a lot of experience yeah. with the pros, uh, being on the court with them and, and making them better. Um, man, I always – hats off to when you can develop an NBA player from the ground up. And when I say ground up, I always think middle school age, right? Yeah. And so you've had that opportunity to do that. What's that journey been like for you to – like, did you already know it? And or did that did it just kind of naturally happen like you're yeah. developing? Uh... Um, well, actually, I mean, not quite middle school, but I almost did it twice. Okay. I met Stanley Johnson when he was like a freshman in high school. Oh man! So that was one oh, of the first people I was working with when I moved here. In the morning at six a.m. every day. Yeah, that was you. That was, I remember that was seeing Stan. It on that was summer. me and Stan. Oh wow! So Stan, Stan was like too big to fail. I remember the first time I met Stan. Uh, I was talking to Coach McKnight, um, me and Charlie were, and we were training Caden Reinhardt and uh, Elijah Brown. Hmm. And Coach was like, can our center jump in the workout with you? And Stan's like peeking his head out, like, because he knows that someone's talking about him. He's trying to see what's going on down the court. And I look at him. And I'm thinking, like, this is the five. This is for sure, like, the senior football player, tight end, <laughs> defensive end dude that plays center and just beats his head on people and rebounds. And he's yeah. going to throw them in with Kate and Elijah, who are, like, high skill guards. Like, uh, I mean, it's his gym. Like, I'm not going to say no, but dang, that stinks. Um, and then I found out Stan was 14. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> He was just like 6'5", 225, oh, just so strong. And then, you know, we do some ball handling. He's like, boom, Allen I like the Allen Iverson yeah. cross. And I'm like, oh, this guy's like really good. Like, who is this? And Charlie's like, Stanley, Stanley Johnson. He's like probably one of the best freshmen in the country. And I was like, oh, okay, like, great, great to have him here. <laughs> um, so he was, you know, he was too big to fail. By the time he was a junior, like, you yeah. knew that he was going to go to the NBA. It was just a matter of like, you know, was something unexpected going to happen. Right. Jared, very different story. Um, so I met Jared through Stan, um, like kind of a long route of different people uh, in the Bay Area when he was like 10 or 11, hmm. kind of like, you know, regular sized pudgy kid. Uh, didn't start training him a bunch till he came to ABA for his eighth grade year. Um, and, when, you know, he was still a little bit on the, the bigger side, uh, not fast, not athletic, very good skills, very coordinated, very poised, very much what you see Jared is today in terms of, like, the way that he approaches basketball and the way that he is on the court of that focus and intensity and competitiveness. Um, but geez, like, you know, we're doing layup drills and this guy's shooting like a one, f I always make fun of him to this day. Like, dude, the first time I saw you take a lay, one, you smoked them all. And two, you shot them like jump shots from one foot away. <laughs> like didn't have any of this for the <laughs> most part, like, or like had it, but just wasn't consistent with it. Um, but he, you know, talk about like, just kind of up and to the right, slowly up and to the right, slowly up and to the right. By the middle of eighth grade, he had gotten himself into really good shape and was pretty chiseled and like really into like not only being physically stronger, but looking the part physically. Mm -hmm. um, and then in ninth grade, uh, you know, I, I kind of we all expected him, his family, everybody went to decide to go to Corona. Uh, kind of all expected him to play JV or just come off the bench, like ninth, 10th man on varsity, somewhere around that range. Um, they had a couple guys leave um, and go to different schools. And so he ends up being the fifth starter. Uh, he's still not very high expectations outside of, you know, he's playing better than expected by a little bit. And then we were at the the tournament in Vegas, that one at Gorman that oh, they yeah. have every year. The, what is that? The Tarkanian yeah, Classic. Tarkanian, yep. And they're the 16 seed playing the one seed in the tournament, and he just went bananas. They mm. didn't, they didn't know that he could shoot like that, and he just had seven threes in the first half. 
ended up with like nine threes, and I think he had like 32. They win that game. They end up winning the tournament as the lowest seed. Um, had a phenomenal year as a freshman. Uh, and even after that, though, like he just, you know, he was ranked in the top 25 just to be, you know, he just doesn't look the part. He doesn't move the part as a freshman. And so you're like, you know, really good player, probably a high major college player. Right. Like, you know, we'll see w what things look like as he grows into the NBA. Sophomore year struggled a lot of the year, you know, was trying to figure out how to play with a lot of good players at that point. It was him, Kylan, and Donnie Dent who were all, you know, yeah. Donnie's not in on a high major team, but Donnie's a high major player. He's sure. like 18 a game at New Mexico. It's killing it. Yeah. And then those two bigs, Devin transferred in. And so he was figuring out how, like, what his space was like. Um, I should have taken more into this, but he had probably the worst workout that I've ever had with him at this. You remember that gym in Carson, the, the lab? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awful gym. Yeah. That, Awful that. hoops. Volleyball hey, court. It's, it's an indoor bad court, lines. Man. It is. The, the it kitchen, is. The kitchen towel floor. Yeah. Kitchen towel floor. <laughs> Jared drove 40 miles on the 91 from Corona to that gym to come there and brick off the front of the rim. I probably ran two and a half miles after his balls. And, uh, you know, it was going through, he was going through the slump while he was playing, too. I think he had had one really nice game against Hillcrest his sophomore year, and everything else was, like, just not the way he wanted to play. Um, and I, after, I was like, hey, man, how's everything going? Like, you know, where's your, what's your confidence like? How you feeling about hoops right now? And he was like, you know, I think I'm good. And I should have taken more into that. I, I don't know if there was enough to take into that, but that's been his thing is, like, very, very, very good at not overreacting to adversity mm -hmm. and continuing to work in spite of, you know, the random results you get over in any short period of time when you're really working hard at something, you know, you can have a two-week stretch where you're just awful. And he doesn't get flustered by that like other people do, I think. And so, you know, then sophomore year, they finish, they play well. Junior year, senior year, very, very, very good player, but even at October, his senior year, he was one of the best players at USA, and I'm talking to, like, some of the guys that do the draft stuff, and they're like, yeah, you know, really good player, loved him this week, three-year, four-year college player for sure, and I'm like, yep, you know, sounds about right. He's played, I love the way he played this week, shot the ball about as well as anybody in the, 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 the mini camp, but you know, this is like he's probably not going to be a one and done player. Um, and I, would, I mean, I told him that I was like, hey, your expectation is just ask Shire when you go on the visit. Will you? I didn't say this specifically. He came up with this question, but he asked him like, I'm committing to you for four years. Are you going to commit to me for four years? I expect to be here for four years. Mm -hmm. So I don't even think he expected wow. to be as good as he was or either that or he was faking it. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, he just kind of, like I said, slow and steady up and to the right the over time, kept working at it, kept working at it, hit adversity his freshman year, um, kept working at it, kept working at it. And then, you know, I think a lot of it, back to the self-awareness thing, those first few big games he had, it was just catching and shooting and shooting one dribble pull-ups. It was the Jared McCain special. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, he had one game where he had 13 on three catch-and-shoot threes and two one dribble pull-ups. And, you know, that's a, it's not a phenomenal game, but 13 will get you some confidence, like in a, you know, playing for Duke. Um, and then he had the Baylor game, and then after that, it was more up and to the right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I would never say that I saw that coming, but it's, it's always nice to be surprised. Yeah, no, and it sounds like the consistency in the workout and the mindset were the two things that really separated him from yeah. the players that you probably dealt with, who probably had more talent than Jared, right? Like uh, raw, this raw ability. Yeah, raw you know? physical ability. Yeah. I'm starting to question whether or not that ability, like the self-awareness, all of that comes together as part of talent. Like you're, yeah. you know, that really creates your ceiling because you can have all the raw ability in the world, but if you don't have all that stuff going on up here, like you, you just can't squeeze the last little bit out of yourself that you need. Yeah, absolutely. Man, awesome stories, and thanks yeah. for sharing. Um, we're we're running 
short on time. I want to get yeah. to our other stuff, but I, I want to. For sure. I really want to talk to you about just the um, mindset as a trainer uh -huh. and what it takes to train pros. There's a lot of people trying to be where you're at. It's okay. Happening for you very naturally. Right? Uh, yeah. And, very but lucky. There's, there's, I'm very sure lucky. there's things that are a part of you character wise that excel above other people that have put you in this position to do that. Yeah, um, maybe. What, what, from that, from the outside, <laughs> looking in, right? You, like you said, self awareness. Yeah. What are those characteristics that um, allow players to trust you with their process, and for you to continue to grow yourself to take them where they need? Yeah. To um, so I think the thing that allows these players to trust you is for you to be the right amount of knowledgeable. Like, if you don't know anything, it's going to be hard for them to trust you because, you know, pro players, even ones that are not on the top end of the basketball understanding and IQ distribution are going to be far above, you know, most other people, um, especially like younger players. So understanding their game enough that, you know, they know that you can empathize with the way they feel on the court. And then I think you have to have, and this was really hard for me, this is my buddy Charlie's the best at it. I think you, it helps a lot to be human and disarming and like personable and relatable and kind of fun and funny a little bit and not too serious about what's going on. Like, you know, these are like the best in the world. Like they have a lot of time where they have to be pretty serious about it. And there are times where, you know, they're going to like really dig in and get busy during the training. But, you know, if we're in the layup warm up and I'm like, go harder, like they're going to get over that real fast because they got to show up so often that it's like, I can't have this guy on my head like this all the time. So being relatable, being disarming, um, I think that stuff really helps. And then um, I think just being really, well, two things to go with that. Being good, but to go with that is like knowing who you're going to connect with. Like there's players that are not, like I'm not for everybody. There's definitely pro players that are very good that I think I would like to work out with that I'm sure if they came and worked out with me would be like, this is not for me. I do not like the way that he's going about it or the style that he's using or like the things that he's teaching me. I would like something else. And then, you know, finding your people, that niche of people that do resonate with you and being able to identify those people quickly and be like, you know, connect with those people, I think is a big deal. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's that's great um, advice for the trainers to yeah. see outside of all the skill stuff and, you know, systems and all the basketball part of it, right? Yeah. The connectivity and just the mindset stepping in on the court with those players. And that doesn't just apply to pros. That really applies to the kids. Everybody. Even more so. I yeah. Think, you know, connecting with the young ones and... Um, being able to have a big impact on their life is, yeah. is having those things. So. Very much so. I think those are general ideas that, ha that really help across the spectrum. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to move to the next uh, three segments of our yeah. show. What do we got? First one, we have My Rushmore. Okay. All right. So you were talking about high IQ passing. Uh, yeah, I'm mean, just going to do passers. It's my, my opinion, passers best passers of all, of all time. time. And I'll do some honorable mentions that I felt like couldn't make the list. Um, I'm gonna like. I put. I think Taya Dosich is the best passer I've ever seen. I would love if somebody's watching this to send me better passers than this. I would love for somebody. Who that is would this? Be great. Milos Taya Dosich. For what, what team? I don't he played know. for this for the Clippers back in like. Oh, mem remember the behind the shoulder? I do remember this guy. Unbelievable! Yes. Looks like he probably okay. smoked cigarettes at halftime. <laughs> like just not that athletic. He's inspirationally good at passing. If you watch his okay. highlights and his Euro stuff, he's like, um, he's phenomenal. Um, probably second best passer of all time. <sighs> like, it, I get stuck between Luka Jokic and Magic and James Harden, and I can only pick three of those. And I really like Larry Bird too. I feel like he was an underrated passer. Man, my list is so different. Keep he going. had this those. He had that. They they are like. Uh, Larry Bird had the the widest variety of wild passes. Like he would throw that one, and he would yeah. throw the behind the heads. And then James Harden had his like, just like unbelievable pick and roll stuff. But if I have to choose, I will say. Uh, 
Luka, Jokic, and Magic. So my Mount Rushmore would be Teodosic, Luka, Jokic, Magic. Best Man. passers. Very, very unique. And I like it. I yeah. see it. I like that because it's more... So mine here, I'm just telling you mine. Yeah, that's yeah. why you can see the difference. Um, I have... I got Ray John Rondo. Actually. Okay. I like that. I, I, I just... Uh, his IQ. The IQ yeah. of his passes. I just... I like his game. Jason Kidd. Yeah. And I'm surprised he's not on your list. I just feel like Jay Kidd... Because she had eyes in the back of his head. Yeah. That him, Magic, is on my list. Yeah. Just because he, not only was he efficient, it was like literally magic, the yeah. things that he was doing. I have to go watch just uh, Taya Dosage. You got to see Taya uh, Dosage. Dosage. My fourth, I have to go Steve Nash. Steve. I, I love go, Steve, too. Yeah, I, I think the, yeah, the simplicity, the soccer behind his passes, yeah. like that part of it. Um Man, that's an awesome list. I'm gonna go check out everybody. Go Phenomenal. Check out Tan, Tan Phenomenal. <laughs> I, awesome. I I like your list a lot. I I the thing I like about well, Jokic is like unique to me because he he does it from a different position than his yeah. traditional, which is a little more like Bird, mm -hmm. but he sh passes more. Um, you could argue you could take him off the list because his he doesn't have the variety of passes that those guys have. Right. But well, I feel like his, the, the, post, the efficiency right? of his passing is extremely high. Yeah. Um, but the thing I like about Luca is he's probably the best I've ever seen. One, the variety is there. Two, the, but the, the shot passes. The yeah. way that he gets people to, it's like a video game. You know, like the players like mm -hmm. go into a certain animation when the player goes to shoot. Mm -hmm. He's the best I've ever seen at getting people out of position by looking like he's going to shoot. I would call it like gather pass and shot passes. Yeah, yeah. And then delivering balls like, I don't even know how he has the strength in, like, yeah. to be in that position and then get the ball back out with power. It's, that's phenomenal to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very true. I, yeah. I think his body of work isn't complete enough it's for not, me to give it to him. But he's I young. get, I 100% understand. That's why yeah. I said like, I like how you're thinking about the – your best passers yeah. you know, versus mine is more of a, almost a flashy, creative, yeah. you know, crafty type passers. 100%. Uh -huh. So, that's um, good. But yeah, check out Taya Dosage. Go yeah. watch these Taya Dosage passes. You'll be like, what the hell is going on? Because he's not that big either. And I forgot. So, I'm kicking somebody off my mouth for Jason Who? Williams. Jason Williams. Oh, flashiest passer of all time for sure. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah. The yeah. behind the back, the, the off the elbow pass in the game is, is still, Legendary. yeah, nice. one of one. Yeah. One um, of one. All right, uh, next part of the show. Fix the net. A misconception about you that you want to make straight. Misconception about me that I want to make straight. Man, when you gave me that before, I had a good one. And then we talked about all this stuff. <laughs> and now I lost it. Come back to that one. What was the other one? I think I had a good one for Misconception the other one. about basketball then. Okay, misconception about basketball. This is my favorite one. Uh, positionless basketball does not mean everybody's a guard. Positionless basketball means that everybody knows how to play every position. Yes. And I think that in America specifically, we have missed on that. And we have like, and that, that actually hurts our national basketball scene heavily in the way that we all think about it in the, you know, people who are trying to be really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be my misconception. I like, man, that is so true. And I think, I think it didn't start like that. I think positionless was that everybody is a guard, right? That's just when you have to stretch fours and yeah. people are stepping away, but it has turned into guards need to know how to post up. And yeah. you need to know how to play out of every single position. They need to know how to court. screen. They need to yes. know how to make those decisions. That's they need to know how to make those is. catches. Those catches are hard. Yeah. Those catches in those small spaces and knowing where people are coming from and how to get the ball back out. Yeah. Dunker spot finishes. Like, that's my Drew, favorite. Like, how, Drew how Holiday. How yes. Drew Holiday showed us all how to be, a, you know, a positionless basketball player from the guard spot. Yeah. It was fire. Yeah. That was big Absolutely. time. Him, Aaron Gordon does a great job, too. Um, for he did it with Denver last year. He kind of did that same thing. He was all yeah. over the court doing all whatever over the he court. needed. But yeah, absolutely. Um, do you remember yours now? Misconception about Dude, you? What do people say about mine. you? You're a great trainer and you do everything right. Oh, this was it. This there was it. This was it. That 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 I must really love basketball training. I'm not. I I do the basketball training the best I can, so that I can test all these things so that I can go play. Wow. Um, I don't really love to do basketball training. It's fine. Like, I don't 
hate it or anything. Like sometimes I'll be like, man, I've been in this gym for a long time. I'm pretty tired. It's hot in here. But uh, it's not like my favorite thing to do or anything. I really like to work on my game. I really like to play. I really like to work on the different parts of my body that need work. As I get older, they need more work. Um, I really like to watch, you know, do clip search for the things that I want to clip search for. I'm not like it's yeah like i said i don't hate it but it's not like i don't love being in the gym for hours on end that is actually a new perspective I've yeah. heard from a trainer who trains at such a high level actually and that's cool i think yeah. i love it because it's just something that you're good at yeah you're just naturally good at and it doesn't have to consume your life yeah. though i don't think i'm naturally good at it i think i work pretty hard at being good at it and i think i'm interested in being good at it because it's you know i kind of i'm kind of locked into this it's not like i can go get a <laughs> computer science job next week if I'm like, oh, I'm over it. So I'm kind of locked into this. So it's like, if I'm going to be here doing it, and this is kind of what my career has to be, I should try and be as good as I possibly can be at it. it. But it's definitely not something where I'm like, I'm dying for this. I'm dying to get in there and train this dude. I enjoy being with some of the guys that I like being with, but that's, yeah. I mean, I enjoy also going to get food with them. Like, I don't need to be training them to enjoy them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I like that. All right, man. Thanks for yeah, sir. That. And our last segment of the show, uh, two questions for me. You're the interviewer. I'm the interviewee. Two questions for me. Two questions for you. What was your game like? How did you get your money when you were at, at, at your peak at as a peak. player? Uh, attacking the rim. Attacking the rim. This is attack. I'm, I'm, I had a 40-something in vertical. Oh, you did? I had, cra I had crazy hops. Oh, um, God, I'm and, jealous. <laughs> and, I could, and I was a streaky shooter, though. Okay. I'm very, very streaky, but... I would, um, that, and on it here, let me flip this. Defense. Let me start okay. there. Defense is my calling card. Got I'll you. lock anybody up. There except you go. Except for Tommy Mitchell, Phil Pressey Jr., and uh, who else cooks me? Uh, Darius Garland. Okay. Those guys cook me. Okay. Ty Tyrese Maxey a little bit, but I think I could lock you up, Tyrese. So I've, I've yeah. guarded all those people. They all have cooked me. Anybody else, I'm pretty sure I can give you fits on the court defense. Yeah. Even to this day, like, my high schoolers can't score on me. Like, okay. I just, that's my, that was my calling card. But my peak was like right after college and okay. I was still training. I was training to try to go overseas. Yep. I was working out for the G League. Classic. I was in tip top shape, all that good stuff. Man, I, yeah, just, I, I had crazy hops and I, people think I'm a shooter depending okay. on what day they played. Now, I literally had some dude who walked into the barbershop the other day. It's like, yo, what's up, man? I ain't seen you in a while. Last time I saw you dunked on me, you hit like seven threes on our team. And he was talking about, I don't even remember him. Yeah. I was like, oh, cool. So some people I'm think a I'm a shooter. I'm a streaky shooter. Okay. Best. I've gone, I hit nine threes in a game before against some, some dudes. Yeah. And that was, you know, so yeah, that's it. I think I'm an amazing passer. Um, okay. Um, I, I see the game different. Nice. Like, just in my, like yeah, my, my prime was, I want to say like Russell Westbrook, man. I was just like crazy oh, explosive. Wow. You were downhill. Oh, yeah, I've caught bodies, man. There you they, go. Yeah, yeah. I've caught yeah. bodies. So just downhill, crazy explosive, super fast, throwing dimes, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. that was my game. Okay, Thanks nice, for that question. nice. I never no, that question. No, that, I always like to hear about people's games. It's always fun, interesting to hear that and then see where they come from in basketball. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I got one more. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Where... If you could, you know, as succinctly as possible, talk about the, you know, kind of your basketball program and how you approach teaching basketball, maybe even just like your favorite things or the things you feel like you teach the best. The things I teach the best. I'm an amazing communicator. So okay. I don't think I teach any one specific thing amazing. I think yeah. I can teach everything to any level of player. Okay. I can just break it down to him because I, I took, I took Chris Johnson's system, right? Okay. His, he has a system that he trains in him and Phil Handy. Like it's a, you can Are pretty they in much the same take, system. It is very very similar. similar. Very very similar. They, they kind of uh, developed it together. Okay. And they have their own. Is there any way in to it. one paragraph to explain that system? There are spots on the court. Okay. There's there's uh, attack spots in the uh, in the key. There's perimeter spots that you attack from, and the decisions that you make have everything to do with getting to those spots and making decisions. And so okay. everything you do in training has to do with making a decision from those spots. So we will never train outside of those 
you, you like if you watch one of their sessions, it is everyone that looks like everyone's doing the same thing, even though they're working on something different, if it makes sense. I don't know. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. I feel That's like I've come to very similar conclusions. I mean, <laughs> there's very limited stuff going on in basketball. You know, you have the court size and you have the lines on the court and you have, you, like, if you know anything, you know, about analytics, you know, where the values are different and mm -hmm. you can quickly derive like, okay, this spot is more valuable than that spot. Yeah, yeah. That, and then footwork, having a good wide base yeah. and being on balance for everything that you do, are, I think are the things that I got from them. And then communicating. So I, I listened to Drew Hanlon for probably five years. Just okay. when he had his stuff online. And yeah. um, just listening to Drew. And so I feel like I communicate like Drew. I think he does a great job communicating what nice. needs to happen. I use Chris's system. And I have, I guess, just my own personal touch is um, I care. I, I see the highest potential in any kid. Like, nice. I will see a kid and I'm like, okay, you are you can get to college. Hey, you can be a pro. You can get to the NBA. Like, I yeah. look at a kid and really give them that encouragement and inspiration and make them believe in themselves. And sometimes it works for them. Sometimes it doesn't. But for, yeah. for a moment, in middle school at least, every single one of those kids believes that they're going to play in college. And so their work ethic changes yeah. in a positive way. And so, um, no, I think those are my... Those are the things I do well. Hell yeah, that's a good breakdown. I like that a lot. Thanks, man. Man, of course. this has been amazing. Wish we had more time. Of We're course. gonna do this again. Um, yeah, we'll do it some and, other uh, time. Absolutely, we'll keep man. the conversation so, rolling. Thank you for being on the show. Appreciate uh, you, have you having me, brother. Shot clock, really quick. Tell okay. people where to find you, or just an inspirational message for the listeners. Uh, yeah, uh, find me on Instagram at uh, Shay dot Frazy. Um, yeah, that's uh, shayfrazy.com is my website. Um, yeah, uh, inspirational message would be uh, you go a lot long, you go a lot further by trying to outlast other people than by trying to, you know, outwork them in a day or a week or, or spend you know more time in any small period of time. Just push your timelines out as far as you can, and then commit to being consistent on that timeline. Love it, man. Hell yeah. Thank you, man. That's all we have for you today. Thank you again to our sponsor, Scene, Max. Good looking. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.